The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to Ayan Oshkosh, Cheryl Hans along with Dan Rylance and uh, very pleased to uh, welcome two esteemed members of our uh, Wisconsin State Legislature. Uh, to my left, you, you know him, he represents this district, uh, Gordon Hans, he's been on here many, many times. And um, uh, we're also very pleased to be joined by uh, Thomas Nelson, or just Tom, I guess mm -hmm. uh, we said, uh, you, you told us we could call you, so we'll call you Tom. Uh, but Tom Nelson is the uh, new Assembly Majority Leader and he is from the Kokana area, and you represent Kokana and where else? Parts of the Fox Valley and, and Green Bay. It's about 20 cities, towns, and villages. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty good diversity, a good collection of the communities in northeast Wisconsin. Okay. So it's rural, suburban, and urban. So. Okay. Now, everybody knows about Gordon. <laughs> And I mean that in a good way. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, tell us a little about yourself. I mean, how old are you? How'd you get started in politics? Mm. And uh, what prompted you to get sure. into politics? Well, um, I ran for election four years ago um, after I finished uh, work at graduate school. And running for office was something that I had uh, thought about doing for some time. And usually when you talk to people who run for office, it's usually because of a particular um, experience or some sort of form of event that kind of compelled them to run for office. And for me, you have to go back many, many years ago when my dad brought the family to the area when he started a Lutheran church in Combined Locks. And at a very young age, I saw that my dad uh, you know, felt compelled to uh, serve his community, his neighbor, through the ministry. In that same vein, um, I found electoral politics to be compelling. I think that public office is a high calling. And about 24 years later, when I first ran for office, I was literally following in his footsteps, going door to door uh, in the same na neighborhoods, in the same communities that he did 24 years earlier when he started church, going door to door, inviting people to worship. Well, religion and politics, you know, those are the those things are the that they say Those are the first two things about. we talk about in my, <laughs> my household. <laughs> the first two you guys talk about. Wow, okay. All right. Well, very good. Well, it's a real pleasure to meet you and, and to okay. have you here. And, yeah, um, you know, as, as you progress as the um, Assembly Majority Leader, hopefully we'll have an opportunity Certainly. to have you back, Certainly. too. So, okay. You've yeah. got all kinds of things yeah. that you want to talk to these well, guys about. Well, kudos so. to both of you. And, and, yeah. and this is uh, historic in the sense that When's the last time the Democrats controlled the assembly in Wisconsin? About 14 years ago. 14 yeah. years ago. So this is this is somewhat historic. And right? It's been 24 years since the Democrats were in charge of both the oh, assembly both. and the Senate okay. and the governor's office. Okay. Wow. Um, have you ever served in the majority before, either one of you? First time. First time. Hey, I only had my first term. Yeah. So yeah, yeah no. Yeah, yeah. But um, something that Tom was mentioning earlier was, you know, it's. I think it's good for everybody to have served a little time yeah. in the minority, just yeah. in terms of. You That's know, what they how used to tell me in North Dakota, except I was always in the minority. But <laughs> how were you treated as a minority, and how do you plan to treat the former majority as a minority? Do you have any mm -hmm. sense about your. I'll let Tom, since he's okay. had four years. <laughs> since I had four years, more yeah, experience yeah, yeah. than Gordon. Well, beat it for two. It was, no, it was no picnic being in the minority, yep. um, especially in the first two years when the numbers were so off. There were 39 Democrats and okay. 60 Republicans. So the Republicans just went forward with their agenda. Sure. You know, they would give us a time of day every once in a while, but that was pretty much what was going on. Now, when Gordon and um, we had seven other new members, uh, okay. we had an eight-seat pickup in 2006. Okay. Well, this last session, things had changed dramatically from the 2005 session to the 2007 session. session even though the Republicans were still in control. And a big part of the reason was there was a change in the speakership, but because the numbers were much closer, 52 to 47, okay. 
verses 60 to 39, and because they had to reach out to the Democrats, and also because the Senate had switched from Republican to Democratic, those were two big reasons, actually three reasons, uh, for why they were reaching out. With. So, so, so in 2007, there was still that partisanship, though, but it had made um, enormous improvements from where it was in 2005. How many Democrats and how many Republicans will there be in, in when you start in January? It's uh, 52 uh, Democrats in the Assembly, okay. 46 Republicans, okay. and one uh, independent. Independent, okay. So Leaning Republican or Democrat? Um, or? I think it's sort of unknown right okay. now. He said he's going to um, be, you know, he was going to serve on committees based on uh, Democratic leadership choices, but okay. I think it's undetermined at this point. Okay, now, Tom, you and Mike Sheridan from Janesville, who was elected speaker, mm -hmm. um, can you kind of just briefly, what are your duties, and are these the two most powerful positions in the mm -hmm. assembly in terms what do you do? Or what? Well, um, basically the speaker and the majority leader uh, together, um, they split up um, a lot of the leadership duties. Okay. It's the speaker who is real. If you think of, um, the best way to compare it is this, the speaker is kind of like the CEO for the entire body. Okay. That's the point person for everyone, Democrats and Republicans. As majority leader, I'm the leader of the Democrats. Okay. Um, although, because the Democrats are in control and the Speaker is also a Democrat, there is a kind of shared responsibility between okay. the two. And Mike and I uh, work in tandem on, on a number of issues. Now, um, a lot of the the control comes from speak Speaker's office, but in the past, and particularly in this case, uh, Mike has made um, an extra effort to include me in a number of discussions. So he and I sat down when it came to parsing out committee responsibilities. Okay. We also sat down and talked about the ratios, the size of the committees. And then my functional role as majority leader is chairing what is called the Rules Committee. Okay. And it's the Rules Committee that is basically the last stop before the assembly floor. Okay. So all the committee chairs, when they pass out bills, it goes to the Rules Committee, of which I chair before it goes okay. to the assembly floor. So in that role, um, I'll be playing a role in setting the legislative agenda, making okay. decisions along with the committee as well as the input for other committee chairs and members of other committees uh, about what kind of bills we're going to be taking on. So a lot of my responsibility is going to be taking place beginning in maybe a, a you know, couple, three or four weeks, whereas Mike has been doing more of the administrative work. Is he the parliamentarian? Is he set up on top, the, the, the speaker? Then there's a third person. Oh, tell us. There's more. There's <laughs> more. <laughs> Uh, speaker pro temp. Okay. He is the member that sits in the chair, and okay. so he will be officiating the day-to-day -day okay. business. But you'll be kind of running the floor. I mean, you're yes. You're so, the, so basically, direction from the floor will come from the majority leader. Okay. So, as I bring up bills from one bill to to to, to the next, okay. I'm communicating with the speaker pro tem. Right. Um, he's running through the par parliamentary procedure. I'm calling for suspension of the rules to move bills along bringing certain bills up from committee that might not have been on the calendar. Okay. So so basically, uh, the, the Speaker Pro Tem and the Majority Leader do most of the navigation on the floor during session days. What, is, what does Gordon get? You know, we, Gordon's been elected as... <laughs> That's a good question. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, does he, does he get a chair of a committee? Uh -huh. uh, uh, what, what, what are Gordon's, you know, he's, we, we, want, yeah. we, want, we want some... Uh, Work out so of what's the majority guy. leader going to do for Oshkosh, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, <coughs> pro arguably the second most important committee, the most important committee okay. after joint finance, okay. I guess considering the fiscal constraints that this state is facing, one of the key committees right. is the Building Commission, of which Gordon is one of just two members among Assembly Democrats okay. sit on that. And it's okay. a very, very important committee because that is the committee that sits with, there are three senators, three members of the Assembly, the governor, and then an at-large member okay. from the state. Yeah. And it's on that committee that goes through, that gives the okay to capital projects, everything oh. from universities. I heard that there's a university in town here. Really? So, <laughs> yeah. You've got some yeah. projects. So, yeah. He so. would be a good representative for that. Yeah. Okay. And he'll also talk to you more because he'll know what kind of agenda he wants to construct. But okay. he's chair of consumer protection. Okay. Now, going back to what I said about how there are these tight economic constraints, right. we're not in a spending mode. Right. We've got to balance this budget. Right. So we're going to be dealing a lot with these non-fiscal items. And a lot of those items will be going to the consumer protection okay. committee. And Okay. Well, can tell us a little bit more about. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I plan on being an active member, okay. but I also want to say, as a member from Northeast Wisconsin, um, you know, Tom is someone who I first met when we both ran in 2004 and kept in touch with. But uh, I nominated him to be majority leader, and 
you know, help get other members to support him largely because Mickey's a hard worker, has a good vision mm -hmm. for where we want to go as a state. But I also thought it was important to get somebody from Northeast Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought the members that we work with the most are people that are in our sort of economic group, mm -hmm. um, Republicans and Democrats from Fond du Lac to Green Bay. And so um, I thought it was going to be good, you know, for us for mm -hmm. sure, um, but also good for Wisconsin. Um, you know, I had an interest in the Building Commission. Um, and who knows what kind of capital projects we might have online given the f federal stimulus discussions going on right now. But um, you know, we can't lose sight of what we want to do long term and a lot of those projects and infrastructure are part of that. You know, mm -hmm. We've got the 41 expansion coming up, yep. the new academic building. Yep. Um, there's going to be, uh, I think, a new facility at the Wisconsin Resource Center. Um, so there's a lot of projects online, not just for the area, but, but statewide. And, and again, in a tough time, um, the capital budget is something that will we'll go forward. Um, and, and we've had representation um, a while ago in the past. I think Senator Ressler served uh, on there as well. Um, Tom mentioned that you know, we all have ideas on things we'd like to do, whether it's tax cuts or funding. Um, those things are sort of off the table while we struggle with the budget. So you really want to look at ways that you can make the state a better place through um, sort of revenue neutral items and uh, consumer protection, I think, is an area um, that I'm interested in and taking feedback from my constituents and others and, you know, following what's happening in other states and, and moving some things forward. Sure. Tom, can I ask how old you are? 32. 32. And um, you've been at this for four years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I, I have to say that there are probably some people in the assembly who have been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> maybe too long, huh, Gordon? Is that what that uh, chuckle means? Um, but, you know, um, you are, for 32 and only being there four years, you're very articulate. Um, and, and I would have to think that that would be another reason why your constituents, mm -hmm. you know, selected you to, to this position. Were you surprised at all that you got this position? She asked Gordon that. He was... <laughs> we were sitting next to each other that day, and, you know, it's, it's a, a secret vote, story. so you never really know sure. how it pans out. Um, I think there are a group of us that are relatively new to the assembly mm -hmm. that, not unlike what happened in the presidential race, are really tired of the traditional arguments that we've had. and and really do want to be proactive. Mm -hmm. We do view this as a full-time, mm -hmm. you know, proactive job and are just tired of sort of the same debates happening mm -hmm. and the same way of doing things. And so I certainly was motivated by wanting to see some people with some new ideas that are really going to throw themselves in it. And, uh, you know, clearly you might have more time and ability to do that um, at that age um, than others. But I don't know. I think we had a good, decent mm -hmm. cross-section of yeah. people. You always try to figure out, you know, where the alliances are. And it's always a tough race because these are your friends and your colleagues and right. people that you sure. need to work with. But there's, you know, sensitive feelings. Are there people that are like, geez, you know, he's only 32? Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. But I had no doubts about, um, you know, his work ethic and seriousness about the position. Mm -hmm. You both ended the session sort of dramatically. Uh, <laughs> you you didn't leave your your seat, did you? When, when the budget was <coughs> how long did it take him to mention it? Like uh, the first fifteen minutes. Well, I, I just got a note card from Gordon. No, uh, so but, but and, and Gordon voted against the budget in the end, didn't you? So I'm, yeah. but so in a sense, you ended that last session, kind of on an. I mean, you, you were out there. I mean, you you were you were making statements, mm -hmm. and it, maybe that carried over a little bit on on, on your election. Well, I think to go back to what what Cheryl asked about that, you know, I think. I think what won the day is I think when people ask about me, I think they'll, they'll say, you know, he's a hardworking person. Uh -huh. I think if you talk to anyone in my district, whether or not they support me or not, Republican sure. or Democrat, they'll say, yeah, Tom Nelson, he's always out there. He's, you know, he's working, he's getting involved uh -huh. and so forth. And the reason why is just that this is something that I'm very passionate about. Uh -huh. As I mentioned before, I think politics is a high calling despite uh -huh. the public opinion polls out there to the contrary. Uh -huh. And, you know, I think there's a lot of things, a lot, a lot of potential the legislature has um, that we just haven't really seen in recent years. What's so exciting is that the Democrats are in control of both houses as well as the governorship. And this really is our opportunity to do a lot of things that we might have been talking about mm -hmm. before but haven't really had that opportunity. And I think if you go back um, uh, to the sit-in, um, what, uh, um, what you were refer um, referring about before, um, it got to the point where I was really frustrated mm -hmm. with the progress or the lack of progress in last year's budget. We got 105 days. We had not passed a budget. Every other state union had passed a budget. <laughs> and the conference committee, um, of which I'm now a member, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> um, refused to meet. And there was a lot of work to be done, and nothing was getting done. And so 
I would go back to my district and constituents would ask me, what are you doing to pass a budget? And I said, well, it's in the conference. I mean, like, it wasn't good enough for them. Mm -hmm. I was their representative. What can you do? So as a rank and file member, I did what anyone could do. And showed up for work and said, I'm going to be here. I'm not going to leave until we pass a budget. And uh, fortunately, it was, it was six, it was a uh, five night and six day, mm -hmm. six uh, day stay. Yeah. And so there were a lot Good of Republicans, timing. yeah, a lot of Republicans were asking, why don't you start doing this back in July? You know, they would have wanted to see me dead. sweat there. For <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, it, well, now that the uh, Democrats have control, um, do you see some things changing as far as rules go uh, on how the assembly is run? Or do you think that that will pretty much stay the same? I mean, from my standpoint, I mentioned the part about being in the minority mm -hmm. and, you know, you want to treat others how you'd be treated. And, uh, you know, I don't think you want to spend your time figuring out how you can get back at people. And I think mm -hmm. most, for the most part, the public is tired of that anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think we retained the chief clerk who was appointed by Republicans mm -hmm. because he did a good job. Um, you know, we let, kept everybody in their offices, even though we could have moved some people out. Um, because we're in the majority. So, I mean, I think mm -hmm. there's been some olive branches extended saying, hey, you know, we want to work with you. Uh, ideally, you want to put ideas on the table and you want to have a healthy uh, debate about what direction you want to mm -hmm. go. And I hope the Republicans in the minority will step up to the plate and offer their suggestions in a you know, reasonable way that we can have debates and discussion on this now. When you're in a two-year cycle and a two-year seat, you know, everybody keeps their eye on the next thing, and, and sure. a five-seat or five-and-a-half, six-seat majority is not much. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're hopeful, and we're going, you know, there are plenty of nonpartisan or bipartisan bills out there that we want to help, if they didn't get through last time, move mm -hmm. forward. But, um, you know, we'll see. I, 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 Tom could probably speak sure. from a leadership standpoint. Well, first of all, the toughest challenge that we're facing is trying to guide this state through the toughest economic times in two generations. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Democrats are in control of both houses the gov and, and the governor's office, too, but um, we are really facing very uncertain times. I mean, we're facing a $5.5 billion budget deficit, the largest in state history. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, too, we know that we're not alone. There are currently 40 other states that are facing a current account deficit in this fiscal year. So this is a problem that's, that's reflective not just of Wisconsin, but of the national economy. So given these kind of constraints, given the challenges, and then also given, you know, I don't look at the last election, the results, as being necessarily a vindication of democratic principles and so forth, but I believe that it was re indicative of a rejection of partisan politics. Mm -hmm. And now we find ourselves in the position of being in control of both houses and the governorship. And so there really is this challenge to lead. And I believe that leading does not include, you know, trying to take partisan pot shots or trying to figure out how to undermine the opposition. And so as Gordon mentioned, we thought it was very, very important to get off on the right foot. Usually when there is a transition of power, that new party gets in charge and basically you know, mm -hmm. throws the other party to the curb, makes them move to the worst office space within the Capitol <laughs> and so forth. And, and it's just something that, that is really not conducive to creating <laughs> the environment where you can work together. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we didn't want to do that. So the Republicans keep their offices, um, keep their parking spaces, all <laughs> and it kind of seems petty though, but really, I mean, it's the little things that you know, can really benefit you in the long run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last year when I was uh, going on and on about how I thought, you know, it was a waste of time that we were only spending 25 days in a two-year period. We were only in session 25 mm -hmm. days. And this is just inconceivable. To I know. And yeah. we're a full-time legislature. And there's plenty of bills and plenty of problems that yeah. really need, you, you know, that yeah. really need that kind of close looking. And now we have the opportunity. And so we want to get off on the right fo of what we, you know, we hope that mm -hmm. the Republicans will reciprocate. Uh, but the ball's in their court. One reform idea for you. One of the differences between a citizen legislature and a full-time legislature is, in a citizen legislature, every bill is disposed of during the session. Mm. How many bills never got to a committee or a hearing in the last couple of years? A lot. A lot. Hundreds. 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 That has to stop, doesn't it? In 2005, 95 percent of the bills that were acted on the assembly were authored by Republicans. Okay. 95 percent. I can tell you as the chairman of the Rules Committee, you know, there's going to be more than 5% of the bills okay. we pass out. And we also expect to meet quite a bit more precisely because the challenges are big sure. and because we're here to govern. We're here to make decisions and, you know, we're not just going to throw our hands in the air and say, oh, Good. geez, you know, we're having a tough economy. So yeah. I would expect us to be a lot more proactive. I mean, the committees were pretty active, I thought, in the last session, but those bills didn't make it. 
Do the chairs in the assembly have the power not to call a beer, hearing on yes. a bill? So, yes. Okay. So you as majority leader can't really, I mean, you can kind of tweak them, but if, if a chair doesn't want to hear a bill, he doesn't have to hear it. Yeah. I mean, I can try to, you know, yeah. twist Gore's yeah, arm yeah. here, you know, get him to do something through the Consumer Protection yeah. Committee, but yeah. no, it's up to the chairs. Okay. And, you know, both Mike and I, Mike Sheridan, the speaker, and I have had numerous conversations talking about how one thing that we want to have different in this um, session is that we're going to empower chairs to be able to give them deference, uh, not just in the membership of their committees, uh, which we've been working mm -hmm. with in, in the past couple, couple of weeks, but also to have a lot of say in the movement of bills. Mm -hmm. I'm in a position where we're going to have like 31, 32 committees, and so at any given day, there's going to be bills coming into my committee, into my office, that I'm going to have to try to schedule on a timely basis. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you went from like a 32 lane highway to a one lane highway, there's going to be a traffic jam mm -hmm. here and there. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, you also had a question mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what happens to a bill when it is introduced but never heard about again. So where does it go? What happens to it? Well, since I had a lot of experience <laughs> in my first term, <laughs> it, it just, it, just it gets referred to a committee. Um, the speaker has to refer a bill to a committee within okay. two weeks, okay. and then it's uh, then it's under the jurisdiction of that committee chairperson, okay. and then he or she has the choice okay. whether or not to have a hearing, a vote, and so forth. What about all those bills that were not here? Do they have to be reintroduced yes. for this new yeah, session? Yes. Okay, they don't carry over. No. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the Democratic <laughs> agenda. Um, you're Democrats, you're in control. You know, here are just some things, i put you on the spot a little bit. Are we looking at a statewide smoking ban in 2009? Yes, mm -hmm. um, and on this one there's bipartisan support okay. and bipartisan opposition, but I think the governor has really okay. made this a priority. Mm -hmm. Okay. Governor Doyle said a couple weeks ago on uh, Then and Now that you know, you're going to repeal QEO. Is, is that uh, likely? I think if it happens, it's going to come from the budget, and okay. um, I have some indication of what's going to be in and what's not going to be in, but this is going to be a moving target for the next month okay. and a half or so, and we're just not going to know the answer to that okay. until maybe the second or third week of February. Can you kind of inform our viewers a little bit, I threw that out, what, yeah. what this would mean? What is QEO and what would the repeal mean? Well, it's called, it's, um, it's uh, short for Qualified Economic okay. Offer, and it was put into place 14 years ago okay. when there was the last reform school funding okay. formula. In very, very simple terms, it's a very, very complicated yeah. formula, though, but there are essentially three parts to it. There is the QEO, and there is revenue caps, and then two-thirds funding. So two-thirds funding mean that, that the state has to meet its obligation right. of paying for two-thirds of, of the cost the throughout right. the state. Right. And then the revenue cap saying that they can only raise property taxes to a certain le level to pay for those services. And then the QEO says that, um, that when they renegotiate contracts for the teachers, that their total package increase uh, um, has to be at 3.8%. It can't be higher than that. So it's capped off at 3.8%. Unless 3 .8%. they agree, agree okay. to it. If they can't reach a deal, right. they can QEO. Right. It just so, so it's kicked in. And so at this time now, when you have health care costs just going through the roof, um, a lot of these teachers, because it's combined, you know, aren't seeing increases in their wages since it's all. completely consumed by right. the high cost of health care. Right. And it's, it's very difficult, I think, for you know, those of us who you know, hear the same things that you're hearing. We've needed school reform for a while. I think the original intention 14 years ago right. with this would be like a five-year thing. We've gotten well beyond that. Yeah. Hundreds of school districts throughout the state are going to referendum because they can't right. meet the... But it's very difficult to change one part of the formula without, you know, we say it's a three-legged stool um, right. without, you know, addressing the others. And one of the challenges is this is coming at a, you know, yeah. a time, you know, in principle, I think everybody should have the right to collectively bargain, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's hard to imagine in this climate doing these things. And I think if you do um, take away that stool, that leg of the stool, I think you have to look at the other two, and mm -hmm. you have to look at all three of them, not just one of them. Collective bargaining for faculty. Uh, I think it passed the Senate last time, mm -hmm. killed in the House uh, or in the Assembly. Is that back as a Democratic agenda? Um, as soon as that bill gets the Rules Committee, I intend to schedule it. Okay. And, and what does that mean for UWO campus, Gordon? It enables uh, faculty at each campus, should they decide okay. to have a vote to organize, um, they can decide you know, to um, form their own union to be able to collectively okay. bargain. And okay. I think, you know, especially given some of the treatment and pay the last few years, sure. there's some interest in that. But it, you know, it'll be up to them. It's not up to us to decide. You just it want enables, to give them the, give them the right to vote, like yeah. many of our neighboring states have. Sure. 
Um, expansion of health care. Yes. That certainly is, um, you know, at the top of everybody's list as far as making sure that everybody's got some kind of affordable and decent health care. Where do you see that going um, when you guys get back into session? Well, I talked to a number of health care advocates um, the last couple of weeks about where they see reform coming down and know that the state has been pushing a couple of reforms in the past. I think what's different this time around um, than last year um, is not necessarily the composition of the legislature being now in Democratic control, but uh, who's in charge in Washington. Now, we've been talking about health care reform in our campaigns. We've been talking about it for several years now. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that President-elect Obama has been talking about health care nonstop mm -hmm. for the last 24 months. And so a lot of people will be having an eye on Washington first to see what kind of action is going to happen there. And keep in mind, too, that the number of reform proposals in the area of health care in recent years, specifically Badger Care, or senior care have been a federal state partnership. So it makes sense as, uh, as state legislators to keep an eye on Washington to see what they're going to do so we can figure out how we can partner to solve a common problem. Because mm -hmm. clearly, I mean, I mean you know, the, the, the uh, problem with, with the access and affordability of health care is not limited to Wisconsin. It's, it's all over this country. Right. Yeah. Tom, you went to Washington earlier or some, mm -hmm. was, was health care one of the agenda items? That, that well, I went to Washington three weeks ago okay. uh, to visit with members of our congressional delegation. Okay. Sat down and spoke with uh, Congressman Dave Obey, who's now the House Appropriations Chairman, mm -hmm. and then also met with the Obama transition team. And the reason why we went out there, I went with uh, Speaker Sheridan and myself. Mm -hmm. And the reason we went out there is we wanted to have a first-hand account on what kind of shape, what kind of form this economic stimulus package is going to take, and then specifically how it's going to affect the state. And what we learned from that trip, and what has been confirmed in recent uh, press accounts is that there is going to be a stimulus package, it's going to be substantial, and a significant part of that package is going to be going to the states. Because the Obama administration and, the, and our congressional delegation, um, when they're looking at the stimulus package, they want to use the states as a vehicle to implement that stimulus. Instead of creating a brand new federal bureaucracy to implement these kind of programs, road and bridge uh, construction repairs and so forth, they want to use existing infrastructure, bureaucratic infrastructure within the states to be able to make those changes. So uh, we started this dialogue uh, between the, the, uh, the transition team, our congressional delegation, and the legislature, and the governor to talk about what we need to do in the legislature and in the state to be able to streamline the processes so when that money is released sometime next year that we're, we're ready to capture those dollars and put them to work right away. Okay. Wisconsin's going to be in good shape with Congress, with Congressman yeah. Obie being chairman That's of the House of Appropriations. That's our ace in the hole. Really that, that is our uh, ace in the hole. I yeah. think he's going to have a lot to do yeah. with our ability to balance that budget. Senator Cole's also on appropriations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Cheryl. Go ahead. No, no, no. That's that's fine. Uh, you know, Gordon, when you've been on in the past, we've talked about uh, combined reporting and closing mm -hmm. some of these tax loopholes, and I'm sure that you're well aware of the problem mm -hmm. with this too, Tom. Um, do you see that now that the Democrats have control? Uh, do you see that as uh, something that can possibly be, you know, worked on a little bit more fervently um, in this next session? Uh, yeah, um, I think overall, you know, look, we're going to have to make some tough priorities and some tough cuts on things that have a direct impact on people's lives, and that is going to be, you know, a tough part of the job. I don't think we're putting ourselves in a hole. I mean, no one wants to run out there and say, I'm going to increase this or increase that, but I think there will be a discussion on the revenue side of things. For instance, it doesn't do us any good at the state level if we cut funding for technical colleges or cut funding to local governments and see mm -hmm. a substantial property tax increase. Um, you know, we've always said we have a 20th century revenue system for a 21st century economy. So, I mean, I think we'll look at things, but everything's going to be aimed at what can we do to help support the economy in a time of transition. And there will be discussions on a lot of the proposals that have been out there um, in the past, and, and there may be some tinkering that we can do to combine reporting to make it more acceptable to people that have opposition to it. But, um, you know, I think it's an idea that's getting more acceptance out there, and, and maybe you can even do some tweaking to, you know, lower the corporate income tax rate for businesses that are paying mm -hmm. now while you close that loophole. So, I mean, I think there's flexibility within the concept where it's not just. Um, you know, again, Minnesota's had this for 25 plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, and they're the state we sort of say, "Gosh, I wish we had all the 5,000 more in income per capita that they have." Well, yeah, uh, when you're looking do. at this kind of a, a deficit in the budget, I mean, why wouldn't you want to try and close that budget gap Absolutely. by by just simply making companies pay their fair share? And I've, you know, we've all heard the arguments out there about why this is not a good thing, mm -hmm. but 
McDonald's hasn't left <laughs> the state of Minnesota mm. or any of these right. other states That's exactly right. that have closed the tax exactly loopholes. Right. They're not going to leave here either. That's exactly right. So. Um, drinking laws. We keep reading in the paper every day, it seems, you know, in some community or another where someone's been busted for their fifth d uh, DWI or OWI, um, their sixth or their seventh, whatever. Um, and people are saying, look, we need tougher drinking laws in the state of Wisconsin. Do you think they're tough enough or do we need to get tougher? Uh, both. Um, I mean, I think the question is, there's been a lot of attention on this, a lot of media reports. The Journal Sentinel's done a pretty aggressive <coughs> reporting following, I think, what our local paper had done. Um, and, and these are so just uh, unacceptable. Um, that being said, changing behavior is a tough thing in a state like this, and I think we need to be smart about it. Um, you know, it hasn't served as a deterrent in the past for people that um, continue to reoffend, but I think you know right, there's solutions right here in Winnebago County with um, the Safe Streets Drug Court program that mm -hmm. I'm Dad. now going to take over for Senator Ressler in terms of introduction in the uh, next <coughs> next session to say you know these are things that can help work, um, but we probably do need to look at you know I think we're going to look at everything and that's why we mm -hmm. have the legislative process. It can't yeah. be reactionary. You know we may look at tougher sentencing, see what works in other states. We may look at the mandatory interlock. Um, but we need to have a real discussion about addressing people's addiction issues, uh, addressing alcoholism, and finding out the best way to break the cycle. Yeah, clearly, I mean, given the gravity of this, this problem and given the kind of attention it's received, that it is a major problem, a very complex problem. And so when you have complex problems, I think it's very important that you take a few steps back and look at the larger issues, the root causes, and then throw all the possible solutions on the table and hopefully have a legislature that will act as a deliberative body where we'll take those concerns, take those issues, work them through the committee process, you know, get a vote on that because... And, 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 and I have to, you know, give a lot of uh, credit um, to the news series at the Northwestern as well as the Post Crescent, the Press Gazette, for calling that kind of attention. I mean, my inbox, my capital <coughs> inbox, as well as my mailbox was, you know, stuffed full of, you know, letters and concerns from a lot of people. I mean, very, very important concerns, too. So I think that this is one issue whose time has come. And I think that there is a critical mass of uh, concern and support to push through some changes. Well, and yet it's not an easy thing, as you said, mm. Gordon, to, to solve because <coughs> there are so many different issues that you have to kind of balance, uh, or hope to balance anyway. And, you know, besides that, you, other than short of locking these people up, you know, for years on end, what Which costs can, a lot of money. Right. What can you do? Because you can, you can revoke their license, you can suspend their license, you can put an interlock device on the, on their vehicle, which which they'll have to blow into a, a device before the car will start. But you know that's not to stop them from driving right. someone else's vehicle. Uh, you know I don't know how it works if you um, have it on your vehicle and then you trade your vehicle in. I don't know if there's something within the mm -hmm. you know transition of paperwork that mm -hmm. that would then have to be placed on the new vehicle. I I don't know how that works, but there's a lot of variables here that uh, people can get away with this if they are determined to get away with it. And so this is a, not an easy yeah. thing that you guys are trying to solve here. New York Times, a couple Sundays ago, <coughs> uh, number one in binge drinking. Uh, um, people in Wisconsin are more likely than anyone else to drive drunk. Uh, drunk drivers in Wisconsin aren't charged with a felony until they have been arrested a fifth time. Is that true? <laughs> Like I said, <laughs> I think we hit the point where there's wow. a lot of uh, there's a lot of momentum behind yeah. making these changes. And at the same time, too, you know, a lot of states have already, you know, you know, taken the leadership, have taken the initiative to make some of those changes. And unfortunately, we haven't been making those changes. And so again, this is another area that's we're going to spend some time on. Wisconsin law prohibits sobriety checks by the police. A common practice in other states. Another one. That'll be controversial. It's a little more <laughs> controversial. Oh, yeah. I don't really yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there are, you know. Those are those serious issues. Although mandatory uh, jail time is is now um, put in place at what the second offense isn't it? Yeah, the first offense is not mm. uh, not criminal. Second offense is. But then fifth time mm. is before it becomes a felony. Yeah. So mm. uh, maybe that's a place to start. Yeah. Although I don't, these yeah. people don't seem to be concerned with <laughs> misdemeanors it's or felonies. No one's talking. No. no one thinks about getting caught. You're no. talking about people that have already shown the propensity to break the law. Yep. Um, I mean, and, and it's it's bigger, but uh, it doesn't mean you say that we no. can't do anything. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's probably you know we can legislate all the laws in the world and we can lock all the people up, but we do need a 
an education component, a preventive component, a treatment component, mm -hmm. and just a cultural understanding that you know it's not really cool to be known for all these things, mm -hmm. and that there are uh, devastating, you know, uh, life-changing uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. Right. Go Let's go to the budget. We saved the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> I thought um, we were almost out of time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> give us, give us the the big picture. Uh, you know, how large is it really? And uh, you know, what are some big game plans? How, how are you going to, how are you going to start to attack it or start to examine it? Well, before we came on the program, Gordon and I sat down and talked. He said, "Okay, when it comes to <laughs> the budget <laughs> issues, you can deal with that." You know. <laughs> Did you say that, Gordon? <laughs> I said, "Well, I don't want to speak for leadership. I've got, <laughs> I mean, I've got my own idea, <laughs> but really, you know, who knows when I'm even going to see it?" Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I mean, the biggest thing is when, you know, we, we start from where we start, and uh -huh. that's with, with what the governor introduces, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, by the second week of okay. February. And we've seen the agency requests, and um, we know the fiscal situation. But, you know, you mentioned health care earlier um, when Tom mentioned the federal government. You know, the other part of this is, you know, we're going to be introducing a budget at a time when there could be a significant fiscal stimulus um, for capital projects, but also maybe a more mm -hmm. supportive federal government. Um, in terms of funding uh, medical assistance, Medicaid, Badger Care, Senior Care, whether it's increased reimbursement or not. So there are, this could be fluid for a while mm -hmm. and also as we saw this fall with the budget numbers, mm -hmm. you know, four bad weeks in the economy and you see the numbers change sure. and change. I mean, the governor was like, it's three million and then right. it was, you know, it's five million and then it's 5.4 million. Okay. So. Um, you know, what the governor puts out is going to be the starting point, and it, because everybody's a Democrat doesn't mean you're going to have, you know, there's going to be a lot of vetting. The mm -hmm. Joint sure. Finance will take yeah. the committee around the state and hold hearings, but um, there are consequences to all the uh, things on the table, and a lot of them are a series of, uh, of bad choices. Yeah. So, you know, I think everything has got to be focused on, you know, there may be, again, there may be tax cuts you want or school funding reform that you want or you want to solve the structural deficit, but the biggest thing is how can we get through the next two years maintaining core services yeah. and doing everything we can to help put people back to work and support the economy. Mm -hmm. I have a real yeah. quick question oh, yep. when, it, when it comes to core services. You know, for years, uh, communities such as Oshkosh has relied on shared revenue mm -hmm. to, to assist with its core services. And that, of course, got cut and cut and cut. And then uh, just in the last year or so, we recently got back up Little smidge. One point one seven percent. <laughs> little smidge of it is an increase. It is yeah. an increase. Yep, yep. Um, is given our economic situation, is any possibility of getting any additional shared revenue out the window, or is that perhaps a possibility? I think in the request as it is now, there is not even a request from the state for an increase. I think it's proposed to stay flat. Um, you know, I had talked to the League of Cities and some other groups about indexing shared revenue to general fund growth, um, and when the economy is good, was up until 25 years ago, yeah. there was an automatic 5% escalator every mm -hmm. single year, which would maintain. Mm -hmm. And then, if you had caps on, it would be reasonable to assume that cities could provide services and keep mm -hmm. property taxes low. Um, I'd be, you know, given I mean, we have serious budget mm -hmm. problems, I think we'd be lucky to stay stay flat. But we, you know, the governor said. One of the reasons schools and local governments are a priority is if we cut 10% to shared revenue, you know, the city of Oshkosh loses $1 million. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot. Yeah. And that gets passed on to either property taxes or reduced services. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the challenges out there is we're not, you know, a business that needs to tighten our belt. There is more demand now for the services that the state of Wisconsin provides and that the city of Oshkosh provides than there is when the economy is good. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's, when people are unemployed, there's more mm -hmm. risky cr criminal behavior, there's more need for police and fire, um, there's more need for access to higher education and the technical colleges. Well, these are all things that the state has a direct role in, and you know that's where you get back to the discussion, what's going to be most supportive for the economy? Um, you know, if you go, I think you're lazy if you go 10% across the board because, again, 60% of what the state spends money on is buying down the property tax. Well, I'd say two things. I mean, our top, our top two priorities 
ought to be um, school aids mm -hmm. and shared revenue. Mm -hmm. And the reason is simple. I mean, it's Gore talked about, as Gore talked about, like, these are the core services. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of services that the everyday, every, the everyday person associates with state government and local government. I mean, 90 percent of the people either have someone that goes to a school, you know, their front yard or their, you know, their streets get plowed, and, you know, lights, the street lights uh, get repaired. I mean, just like basic kind of services that we take for granted, but are very, very important for the everyday person. So that's number one. The other reason too is the linkage to the property tax system, and that if the state doesn't uphold its commitment to fully fund schools or to give adequate funds uh, to uh, cities, mm -hmm. towns, villages, and counties, they either have they have no choice but to either cut those critical services or raise property taxes. So what's going to happen then is that we're going to keep, you know, this two thirds for schools and shared revenue and we're going to cut the hell out of the University of Wisconsin system and the only way we're going to get that back is to raise tu tuition which we've been doing in high percentages over the last 10 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. I mean this is what in 2003 before either of us was in the mm -hmm. legislature during that budget and that's when they had the 3.2 billion dollar deficit mm -hmm. that is we were one of five states to maintain funding for medical assistance but the university took a 250 million dollar mm -hmm. cut and 150 million of that was raised in tuition mm -hmm. so if you talk to those students and those parents that's not not raising taxes that's significant and, yeah. and you don't you know the, the, the problem with that and why I think we really got to be careful about that is you don't want to put up an extra obstacle for people to return to school at a time yeah. when we need these people. Right. I, mean, I spoke That's at graduation right. last week and said, you know, we need you. Yeah. You know, we need you to stay here and we need you to work hard um, like they did in school. So I don't, you know, I mean, I think there's yeah. going to be an aggressive push to address these things, but we can't, I can't minimize sure. the, the, the gap right now. <coughs> I mean, it is, you know, 80% of that big number, that 5.4 is is because the bottom of the economy came yeah. out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you look at too those students that started school back in two thousand and three that really began to feel that that right. brunt and has been easier the last few years either, those are the same uh, students who are now entering the workforce and probably the worst time to enter the workforce That's for right. twenty years. And on top of that, they have uh, more more debt that they're carrying uh, than maybe uh, students five six years ago mm -hmm. carried. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Todd Berry was interviewed the head of the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance last week. He said. <clears> that if you cut out new spending, you're down to 1.8, 1.9 billion. Mm -hmm. is, is that seem reasonable? Well, I think what he's not taking in consideration is that a lot of that growth comes from entitlement programs, okay. uh, programs like senior care. Okay. Um, that is a very, very important program. There are over 100,000 of our elderly who subscribe to senior care, and it's a very important program. It actually costs the federal government less than it does for Medicare Part D, mm -hmm. and also carries a better benefit. Now, not just those seniors, but also all those family members that are that are indirectly affected by it because if those seniors can't afford those prescription drugs, it's the family and friends that have to pay for it. So it's those kind of programs, mm -hmm. like senior care. And it's these are the kind of economic times when people are desperate that they're going to be turning to those kind of programs. So automatically, if you meet that criteria, you receive that benefit. And so a lot of the increase uh, that Mr. Berry is speaking mm -hmm. about are those kind of programs um, that in current law, um, it's not that only a certain number of people mm -hmm. are eligible for that, but if you meet the criteria, you receive that. So it's a little more difficult than to say, you know, we have to keep it at a certain level or to even cut back. Now, we can cut back administrative costs, and the governor has directed mm -hmm. those agencies to make a 10% across-the-board cut on administration. Mm -hmm. And I believe that just given the level of attrition right now, the number of people who are leaving the workforce, that we can make up a good part of that 10% cut just on attrition alone. But I think the 5.4 <coughs> number really indicates what it would cost the state of Wisconsin to pay for all the services that it provides now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in going through some of, you know, there's a $22 million increase request in the corrections budget for food, medicine, uniforms at our prisons. Mm -hmm. uh, well, health is going up, prescription drugs are going up, you know, we've got 24,000 people incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You know, just the food, uh, health care, uh, uniforms, that was $22 million to do the same thing. The cost to continue at the university, in other words, to do the exact same thing we do at the university, is about $120 million. You've got 32,000 employees getting a 1% increase over two years. Uh, it adds up. Yeah. So, you know, that's the new spending that he's talking right. about, but, you know. Which is it, really just continuation. It's not really new yeah, spending. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand why people sometimes, yeah. you know, see it or get frustrated or why do things get more expensive, but, you know, a lot of what government does are, are, are either direct assistance to people or are, are labor-intensive positions that, you know, you're not going to pay them the same thing you did in 1985.
do we want to talk about increasing taxes? Let's say you get down to the end <laughs> and you still got a billion dollars. Now, Barry said he predicted one of two things. One is you're going to do what they've done in the past. You're just going to push it aside and deal, <laughs> let someone else deal with it later. Or you're going to talk about a tax increase and then you're going to debate whether it'll be a temporary tax increase to get rid of that $1 billion or whether it's going to be permanent. Mm -hmm. what, what's your response to either one of those points? Well, I think on the first point about pushing things aside, yes, that has been, um, that has been the pattern mm -hmm. in past budgets. There's no question. The kind of budgeting that we've done in past budgets has not been sustainable budgeting. I know that Gore has been a very vocal opponent to that, mm -hmm. even though uh, the governors of our same party, I mean, Gore has been very out, out front talking about how you know this is just not sustainable. Mm -hmm. In the last budget repair bill that we passed, I think it was back in May or so, um, has a lot to do um, with the initial part of the shortfall we're now experiencing, that you're just simply using these accounting gimmicks uh, mm -hmm. to move money around from one fund to the next, or simply to delay payment by a couple of weeks so it's reflected in the next fiscal year in the case of school funding because the school calendar doesn't you know coincide with the fiscal calendar and so you're able to do those kind of tricks mm -hmm. so is that going to happen maybe maybe not um, but you know right now in December in January I think we're going to be doing a lot of guesswork when mm -hmm. in fact you know much of that answer is going to be seen in February. Sure. I mean, if you cut spending you're taking money out of the economy if you raise taxes you're taking money out of the economy mm -hmm. I mean neither is you know what you necessarily want to do at a time like this, but uh, you know, clearly the last thing we want to do is uh, you know raise revenues, mm -hmm. and uh, but you know you've got to weigh those against everything sure. else, and there may be some that make more sense, or some that we're overdue, or there's ways that we can incentivize the system to you know do things in a fairer way. Uh, some of the things we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but um, again, as someone who's been someone who wants to balance the structural deficit. Uh, even I am saying in the next two years, same as the federal government, you know, let's do what is best for um, helping support the economy. And again, if that's funding the universities or finding a way to pay for technical colleges and maintain core services, you know, let's do that mm -hmm. um, and, you know, get this state back on track and then, you know, revisit the things that you know, we should be doing like having a rainy day fund and some other sure. things. I think that I think the one takeaway that your viewers should take mm -hmm. away from this conversation talking about the budget is the fact that Wisconsin is one of 41 states mm -hmm. that's facing a current account deficit. This is not a Wisconsin problem exclusively. This is a problem shared by the entire country because of the failing national economy. If you were to take that five and a half billion dollar shortfall and pick it apart, I would say 10 or 15 or 20 percent is because of the budgeting practices that we've engaged in, in the past, but the lion's share, 80 percent or more, is because of the failing economy, the failing national economy, and that is why it is so important that legislators work with the governor, with our congressional delegation, with the incoming um, um, Obama transition team to make sure that we receive our fair share of federal dollars from the stimulus package uh, because the signals that we're getting from Washington is they recognize that our budget uh, situation is is reflective of the national economy and they have taken steps to try to correct those problems and now they're focused on how to deal with you know these budget deficits across the country there's a cumulative 200 billion dollars worth of public debt that the states are facing mm -hmm. One of the things that um, that we've all seen um, in in the last few years, um, as property um, levy freezes go into effect and shared revenues continue to get cut, is fees <laughs> that are either raised or um, communities trying to institute new fees. Um, which around here that didn't go too far, I at least with the garbage fee. But um, do you see it as a way of um, you know trying to um, garner more money at the state level, um, the implementation of any new fees or raising fees that are already in existence? Well, I believe that the governor's gone on the record saying that he opposes increases to car registration fees, which is really being, when we talk about fees, the kind of fee that hits a lot of people, mm -hmm. most people, is going to be the vehicle registration fee. So there, are, so there is an indication that that's just not going to happen. That went up just recently to 75, mm -hmm. didn't it? Yeah. So. But we've traditionally been a higher tax, lower fee state, mm -hmm. and when fees are considered, tuition is also thrown in there as yeah. ultimately a fee. And um, you know, that's something that needs to be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, thrown into that discussion as well. Um, I think I saw the New York budget proposal the other day and it had something like 188 <coughs> new taxes and fees in it. Mm -hmm. um, I think everything will be on the table to evaluate, but again, 
Um, you want to try to make priorities on what you're going to cut <coughs> in spending, and there will be cuts, and there'll be a lot of probably across the board, or you know maybe things that were originally supposed to be in the budget we delay for two years that we'd like to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then we'll evaluate you know the incidence of some of these fees and how they hit people, and um, what we can lower, and what might be fair, or what might be acceptable, but. Um, I can't, you know, I can't say that you know we're not going to cut spending and we're not going to raise fees going into a budget when yeah. just about everything's going to be on the table. Yeah. Everything's going to be on the table, and there are going to be deep cuts. And when I when I, when I talk about that five and a half billion dollar figure, saying you know eighty percent is because of the national economy, you know twenty percent. Yes, we are going to have to make those deep cuts, and everything is going to have to be on the table. I mean, this is considerably radically different than it was two years ago and the times before that. I mean, two thousand three, we were facing a three point two billion dollar shortfall. But that's nothing compared to what we're dealing with now. And, and the national economy could get worse. Yeah. <coughs> but let's keep in mind, too, when, when we talk about the national economy, when we talk about the budget deficit, those two issues are so closely interlocked mm -hmm. that we know that the only way out of this budget deficit is the only way out of uh, dealing with this failing economy, and that's through jobs. We have to focus like a laser on jobs and the economy. If people don't have jobs, they're not paying taxes. They're not spending. They're not paying taxes and so forth. And so it's absolutely critical that we focus on what we can do as a legislature to try to get people back to work. And one way to do that is to do everything we can to capture those federal dollars that are going to be going into those road and bridge projects because those are dollars that go to repair our crumbling infrastructure and put the people right here in our communities to work. You know, no, nobody likes paying taxes, and, and it's been said that we are one of the um, highest taxed states in the union, and I, I don't know exactly where we rank, and of course that's got a lot of variables to it too, whether you're a you know, property owner, a business owner, what have you. Um, but it's interesting to, to look at other states. You know, you've got Arizona that doesn't have, they don't pay any personal income tax there. Um, but yet they have a higher sales tax. Um, I've, I've got some friends and a family member in Virginia, and there, if you get a speeding ticket, I mean, it, it's like a thousand bucks for a yep. resident of Virginia, or mm -hmm. over a thousand. Now, if you're just passing through, that's one thing, but if you're a resident of that state, it's ungodly high. Wow. And they also have taxes on um, your, your personal property, like on your car, for example, you don't just pay a registration fee each year. You're constantly paying a, a tax on the value of that car, so your tax is going down on it each year. But so, in many respects, we have it pretty good here, um, and yet <laughs> it's not so great. So it's just a matter of how you look at it. They're never going to be popular. Uh, we are, you know, states that have a balanced revenue system have the sales, income, and property, um, and that's important for stability. Um, I know the Virginia situation, if they had raised their gas tax a cent, they could have raised the $60 million they needed for the transportation fund. Instead, they raised a surcharge on speeding tickets, $1,000. So instead of having everybody pay a cent on their <laughs> gas, you get charged $1,000 on top of your $150 speeding ticket. Well, it's got people over there outraged. It does. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, those are, I don't think we're going to do that. No, no, no. <laughs> well, that's, that's one thing, too, to is hear. having 49 <laughs> other sets of legislatures, we can learn. We, you know, we do a lot of driving, do too. <laughs> so. <laughs> I have to go through Rosendale, so I don't want to. <laughs> Good point. I have never gone over 30. I mean, it is right through. And you can always tell. Cruise like, control in Rosendale. <laughs> <laughs> and you can always tell, like, who's been through that or not, because, you know, if it's the first time through Ro Rosendale, there's, like, you know, two inches between the bombers, like, look, I'm doing you a favor, buddy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> follow me or the guy that's like keeping you you know three or four car lengths behind you <laughs> what uh, any not personal legislation but but either of you have any particular bills you want to sponsor or, or, yeah. or to be involved Could maybe go through a couple yeah well we are one of three states in this country that has absolutely no regulations over payday loan stores in the early, early 1990s oh, okay. there was the, there was the um, lifting of the usury laws and as a result as a consequence um, we have the most payday loan stores than really any other state on, on a per capita basis okay. I mean every strip mall it seems to have these and these are and these are places that are charging you know two thousand dollars APR financing you mm -hmm. have people that you know and, and I'm taking a hundred dollar loan and because they have to roll it over again and again end up paying over twelve hundred dollars in fees I mean it and is we have people that contact that goes my to Gordon's committee probably yeah. borrowed and huh? it, it is and that's one of the things I'm interested in doing yeah. but yeah. when this you know the other you know these these are the types of issues mm -hmm. that impact affordability mm -hmm. um, in times like now and I think 
it's something that we need to, you know, we are one of the few states. Some states are going as far as closing them down. But I have people that contact my office that say, you know, I borrowed $100 or my aunt borrowed $100 and she's 10 grand in the hole now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm, I'm not for people making, I'm against, not, I'm not against people making money, but mm -hmm. this is the kind of predatory thing that, you know, takes advantage of people that find themselves in tough places. Especially this time. I mean, mm -hmm. this is yeah. the worst kind of time to put yeah. somebody through that, you know, ruining their credit, putting them, you know, in debt. And it's the kind of people that are really at the end of their rope mm -hmm. and that they have nowhere else to go until they go to these stores. I mean, these these places are nothing short of legalized loan sharks. Mm -hmm. and, and something and has to be done. We were both on a bill that Tom introduced last year that capped interest rates and that will mm -hmm. go a long way, we think, to protecting people, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, we've got other bills as well aimed sure. at, uh, there's renters right now who are being uh, evicted on one day notice because they rent from uh, houses that have been foreclosed mm -hmm. on. I've got a bill that would have mm -hmm. a 60-day limit on uh, before they could be foreclosed. So, I mean, these are the types of bills that in this time, in this economy, don't cost anything, but can go you know, a long ways towards yeah. you know, affordability. Yeah. Basically. Sure. I mean, affordability, we're, we're, security. Yeah. I mean, we're, when we're talking about the economy and we're talking about jobs, and we always and we do talk about targeted tax cuts for for businesses to bring cute jobs here. But let's talk about the everyday person. Let's talk about the seniors trying to afford prescription drugs. So there's a bill out there that would suspend the minimum markup law as it applies to prescription drugs. That would make prescription drugs more affordable to our to our seniors. That's something that we can do by very quick and easy change in the law. And just like the payday, uh, the, the uh, payday loan legislation, just like the renters le le legislation, it would go to the heart of just making life more affordable mm -hmm. to working families. All right. Uh, our time's almost up here, but Gordon, um, off camera before we started, you were talking about uh, you, you've been hearing from, from, from some folks on the um, cable competition bill that uh, was uh, approved Earlier yeah. this year, or was it late last um, year? I've kind of lost. 2007. Track. So okay. it's already been. I think it may have been implemented about a year yeah. ago. Um, they're complaining, and probably rightfully so. What are you hearing from folks? Well, this was one of the things that um, the governor had made a lot of vetoes that certainly improved the bill, but said the legislature is going to need to come back and address some of the um, peg issues related to. Um, what stations it can be located on and uh, some of the consumer protection elements as well. And when I talked to um, the people at the Department of Trade and Consumer Protection, they said this is what they're largely hearing about. And a lot of it relates to the impact on, well, no surprise, uh, public access stations like, uh, like uh, the ones we have here in Oshkosh. So, um, yeah, I think we will revisit it. I mean, look, we pass a lot of bills. Sometimes there's things we know that we'll need to fix down the road or there's unintended consequences. And, um, you know, we may revisit, you know, some of those as well um, and address some of the shortcomings that maybe uh, didn't get addressed in the you first bill. You voted against that bill, right? I did, yeah. um, for a variety of reasons. Yep. And I do think the bill was improved uh, substantially by the governor's vetoes. But there were some things that, um, you know, he said in his veto message should, should be addressed as well. And look, I mean, I hope, you know, my goal was for the bill to work out sure. yeah. uh, and wanted to see the jobs created here. Um, but I, I, you know, you got to vote with based on what you have at the time, mm -hmm. and, and I, I wasn't confident at the time. What, what's the main complaint that you're hearing, Gordon? Well, um, there was supposed to be a priority made of having the uh, uh, cable access stations in the first 10 stations. Um, some of the, you know, charter and other groups out there, because it opened everything up, have to put things on. They're putting on, on channel 900 and stuff, and mm -hmm. basic, basic cable subscribers can't get it. Um, mm. You know, just, uh, I mean, people have always complained about cable companies sure. for a while, which yeah. is why we wanted cable competition. But these were some that were highlighted the other day. So, okay. let's oh, see what good. we can do. Well, thanks to both of you very yeah, much for being here. Yeah, good luck to both of you. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. It should you. be uh, an exciting uh, upcoming yeah. term. So. And I hope we can Look have it back. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we'd like to do this yep. more often. So um, as we, um, you know, have looked at your upcoming year, uh, we will take this opportunity to wish you a happy new year, and uh, we'll see you in 09. Until then, uh, keep your eye on us. We've got all right on Oshkosh.